Well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, this is the last session of kind of our morning part of the conference today. Um, if you have just joined us, uh, I just want to let you know if you have any questions, submit those to the Q&A module uh, and any troubleshooting issues, please do, the, do that through the chat. Also, we will be recording um, all the sessions today, so if you want to go back and listen to this session again, that will be available after the conference. Um, I also want to just real quick thank our moderator, Young Lee, who has been leading our Q&A for the last few sessions. Um, and then also, if you want to look at uh, the full or brief program for this afternoon sessions, that's at newprairiepress.org forward slash CPN Dam. Uh, so for our session uh, at right now, it's Beyond Electronic Dreams, Instituting a Dam Program Where It Is Needed But Maybe Not Wanted. This is presented by Greg Johnson, who is the Assistant Librarian for Research and Instruction at Knox College. I will turn it over to you, Greg. That goes with what I was just actually saying is, um, please bear with me, this is my first academic presentation in um, roughly 10 years. So I'm just getting back on the horse. So if there's anything weird or anything, just chalk it up to nerves. Um, the second thing is uh, when I was actually uh, a green archivist coming out of graduate school, one of the first people I talked to about digital archiving and digital asset management and working with digital files, oddly enough, was Dan Noonan at, the, uh, the, at Ohio State University. Um, so it's interesting that I'm following him. It's kind of like my career has come full circle. I, I, he was the first person I talked to. And, um, following him in my, uh, my first presentation in 10 years. So that's, um, that's pretty cool. So uh, all pleasantries aside, let me get started. Um, so what I'm gonna go over is just kind of my career so far in digital asset management and also in digital archiving. Uh, I've spent the last um, 10 years working between corporate archives, corporate digital asset management, and digital archives and academic digital you know, asset management. So I was gonna go through and compare the two, compare and contrast the two. Um, I've worked in a Fortune 500 company that had terabytes of information stored in computers all over the place in different states, different countries, um, as well as a small startup company where we dealt with customers. Um, we specifically archived for them, um, which was an interesting treat. Um, and then worked also in two different digital archive programs. Um, I helped set up the one at the University of Toledo. Um, I was hired as the first digital archivist that they had there and helped set it up and then moved us into the Ohio Link program, which is run by the state of Ohio. Um, if you've never looked into it, um, the state of Ohio library system is probably one of the best I've dealt with. And they have a digital repository for the state, as well as an EAD um, repository for finding aids as well. Um, really interesting stuff. I would highly recommend taking a look at that. And then also I, I then left and went to Governor State University, which is a very small school outside of Chicago and was given the task of rebuilding a DSpace instance from the ground up, literally actually building it from the ground up. Um, so it was an interesting compare and contrast between those things. And then I'm going to look at how things, all of these are similar and how they differ. Um, there's a lot of skills that I brought from the academic world into my corporate work and vice versa. Um, some of the stuff that I learned um, while working at the small startup I actually brought into Governor State as well. So. Um, they're a lot alike. I know there's a lot of contention at times between the two, and if you just look in the job market, there is. But there's a lot that's similar between the two, um, the two, two, two different mindsets of um, digital asset management, digital archiving. Um, and then what we can learn from both of them, you know, there's, there's pros and cons of both. Um, the digital asset management world does a lot of stuff incredibly well. Um, but at the same time, it also does a lot of things that don't make a lot of sense. Uh, the same thing with the digital archive programs that I've worked at. We, we did a lot of things that made sense. We, we followed a lot of, you know, more of the library um, way of looking at it, the archive way of looking at things. And it, it worked well, but at the same time, we could have brought some of the things that I've worked with in the corporate world over and things might have worked a little better. So I'm just going to kind of go over all of those things and then uh, open it up for questions at the end. Uh, so so the, the first one I'm going to go into, it's a, this, is, this is not chronological. Um, I worked at a company called Masco Cabinetry, um, which no one has probably heard of, but they actually own a lot of the larger cabinet brands in the country. And I was tasked with um, creating a digital asset management program for, for Masco Cabinetry. Uh, we, have rough, we had roughly 35,000 employees um, spread out over five states, uh, as well as um, in China and Canada and also in um, different countries in Europe. So we had stuff just about everywhere. We had digital assets, which included video, we had um, audio, we had documents, 
we had raw files, we had images, we had just about anything you could think of that is um, a digital asset. We had it in some form somewhere, um, not cataloged, not organized, usually on computers, on hard drives. Um, one of the, the more terrifying instances was we had two terabytes of stuff on a, um, of files on a portable hard drive under someone's desk that was actually failing and every once in a while was hit by the cleaning crew, um, so it was starting to go out. These were um, a lot of the creative marketing files that we had built up over the last um, 15 years that we wanted to keep you know, access to for historical purposes and then also so we could have them to use. So once the person who was actually running, who actually had that desk finally came to his boss and said, we need to do something about this, they recognized that they actually had a librarian in their company um, who was masquerading as a marketing person uh, who was building you know, uh, marketing materials. So they came to me and tasked me with looking at setting up a digital asset management program in at Masco Cabinetry. So we started off by actually looking at um, 10 different DAM providers. Um, there are a large amount of companies that are actually doing digital asset management in the, the corporate world. And we turned to a consulting firm um, named Gartner to, to work with them to actually find out, you know, who are like the top 10 um, DAM providers. Uh, it was a little, I wasn't happy with their list. Uh, it seemed to be kind of at odds with a lot of the stuff that I've been researching, but I started looking at their 10 and we had narrowed it down to three companies that we wanted to invite into our um, into the business and actually sit down with them and talk to them about what systems they had, demo their systems, have them talk with our IT people, actually go through the full process of vetting um, all of their systems to, to make sure that it was what we were looking for. Um, we ended up with a company that uh, that did a lot of stuff in the cloud, which was one of the things that sold us on them. We actually did not want to have any architecture, any um, infrastructure on the ground at our company. We wanted to have everything in the cloud. We wanted to have everything up to them to fix. Um, the one thing we didn't actually pay attention to was that also required us to up our bandwidth, which we did not do. But that's a, something from one of the lessons learned later. Um, so I pitched this, this full plan to our executives you know, with a full you know, return on investment over three years, uh, discussing all the pros and cons. And this is where I actually brought in a lot of the stuff that I had learned in graduate school that I had learned at the University of Toledo. Um, and also at um, Governor State University, I actually brought in archival principles, archival theory, um, discussing preservation and access and discussing how we could actually you know, make this a proper system to use so it's, everything's available to our workers, but at the same time, we could also preserve our history in this, which kind of blew their minds. They've never actually thought about it that way, but I sold it as I was creating both an access system as well as a preservation system. Um, so then I had to get by and had to go into our marketing, sales, and training departments um, and find out, you know, what systems they're using and then find out if our systems actually would, or the new dam system would actually work with them. So working with Salesforce, working with our website, our CRM, working with other systems, um, a PIM, which is a product information management system, making sure all of these systems talk to each other, work together, and then also the human aspect of it, you know, do you guys want to use this? How would you use this? How do you want this set up? Um, going in and selling it to them, which is something I've always been good at. Um, went in and talked to people, you know, person to person, in small groups and sold it to them. And then collected the assets. Um, although I list six um, terabytes of assets on here, we actually ended up around seven and a half um, in just various places, you know, trying to get them from different companies, different vendors, trying to get them from people who had on their computers, um, working with different operating systems. Most of the stuff our creatives use, um, they all use Macs. So getting hard drives that are formatted, formatted for Mac as well as hard drives that are formatted um, to work with PCs and back and forth, um, trying to make sure everything worked together. Um, so we collected all of those assets and then also working with uh, metadata creation. Um, this is where the, the corporate side came in and I actually sat down and talked to the people who would be using the system as well as the content experts. Uh, we have designers who can look at a cabinet um, that was built 15 years ago and tell you the style, the color, the finish, the doorknobs, the whole nine yards. So I brought them in as content experts because as a person who was a librarian by trade, I was not a cabinet person. So I actually worked with them to find out, you know, what what do we, how do we need to name this? How do we name this to actually make it make sense for the people who are going to use the system and then set up a, a metadata um, schema to actually fit that? Um, I used basic you know, principles that I learned in graduate school and worked on you know, as much um, simplicity as possible as well as working on keeping it um, pretty much similar across the board, but there were just certain things that had to be you know, cabinet specific or stuff like, stuff like that. Um, and then organization and ingest. This was actually going to get the, the stuff from all of the different vendors, um, talking with vendors in different states, different countries, and finding out what they had, um, working on a plan to get the stuff from them and have them organize it before they get it to me so I can actually figure out what they were sending me. 
Um, this whole process took roughly six months. Unfortunately, one of those months was the Christmas season. So really, I had about five months to do this to completely build um, a digital asset management program at a Fortune 500 company relatively by myself. Um, so the main goals that we were looking for is we were looking for a system that was um, that had quick ingest. We wanted something that people could use and get stuff into quickly. Um, I had been creating workflows and stuff like that to get everything ready so we can actually have a system to get everything into the dam. Um, we wanted ready access. This thing had to be available 24 seven was one of the things we pushed to our um, the dam providers that we talked to is this thing had to work all the time. There was no downtime. We wanted to, we ended up working with WebDam, the company that we went with and had a 99.9% .9 uptime um, guarantee because we had to have this system working at all times because we had people working in all time zones. So it was a requirement to have this thing work at all times. And then we also had to have an easy system for de-exceptioning um, items out of the dam. There were some items that needed to be pulled either because we didn't like that style of cabinet anymore, if we changed different types of cabinets. Um, there were also legal purposes. Some things had to be pulled down after a certain time period. Some things had to be pulled down during certain sales um, and stuff like that. So we had to have an easy way to actually comb through all these documents and actually end assets and to be able to pull them out as quick as possible. Um, one of the things that I went into this with um, the mindset was that this was not an IT project. Uh, a lot of times DAM is seen as an IT project in the corporate world and I pushed it as a marketing project. This is something that the marketing department needs as well as something we needed to preserve the history of Masco cabinetry because we had cabinets, one of the cabinet companies went back to 1945. So we had a long history of, of you know, cabinetry. We had to make sure that this was being preserved and being saved. So I pushed it more as a marketing and a historical project. So the second place I actually worked, um, once again, this is not chronological, was a, um, a, sm a st small startup company in Chicago. Uh, it was Morgan Street Document Systems. Uh, it was a very small company. I was uh, employee number 16. And that included all the people who founded it. So I was really like employee number five. Um, it was a small startup company. We, our main goal was to actually rid the world of paper. That was um, almost like the mission statement for the company was we were going to make a paperless world. Um, we were going to do this by actually working with high net and high wealth, high net wealth individuals and digitize all of their documents to actually get them in legal quality. So they're available to them wherever they were. So this would be divorce decrees, marriage decrees, um, any tax documents, um, anything they needed, any document they needed at a moment's notice. We were working with them to uh, get these things put into the cloud so they'd have, the avail they'd have them available 24-7. Um, so we worked with customers, we worked with very wealthy customers, um, working with them to um, meet their document management needs. Um, one of the customers we actually worked with was a former Secretary of State who had his papers in the Library of Congress. So one of the best things about this job was I spent seven weeks in the Library of Congress dig um, digitizing um, the works of the former Secretary of State. Um, it was 400 linear feet of um, materials, 999 boxes, uh, roughly 345,000 items. Um, which leads me into one of the issues we had was we had told them that we could do this, uh, all this digitization with a skeleton crew made up of college students, we could do this in less than two months. Um, I wasn't the one who sold it. Uh, and once they told me, it freaked me out. But being a trooper, I went in and tried to help, and we finished probably a third of that by the time our time limit had run out. Um, so the metadata that we used, once again, kind of going back to my, my library days, was we used a simple, a simple um, system, as well as the organization of NGS. Everything was as simple as possible, and everything was as standard as possible. Um, each customer had a different type of metadata based on their needs, but the structure was the same. So we had you know, financial documents, we had personal documents, broken down then into mortgage documents, legal documents, and, and broke everything down into the same classifiers um, for folders, but then also then, from there, it actually then started to work more and become more personalized. Uh, this allowed us to set up a system where we could actually look across all of the different customers that we had and kind of see across the board, see where you know, documents were, see where we could help our customers get more stuff into, their, into what we call their vaults and work with them to make sure that they, uh, all of their stuff was in there and available. Um, so the, for this system, the, ease, the real thing that we drove for was once again, easy ingest and easy access, but then also legal quality. And we also had to have 100% uptime because if a wealthy person wants their documents, someone who's used to getting what they want, they want something 24 seven whenever they want it. And then also there was a training aspect because we weren't going to the secretary of state and saying, this is how you use your system. We were going to his lawyers, his accountants, his legal representation. We were going to all the people who worked with him 
to train them on how to use this system. So there was a lot of training that went into the system, um, into this, this position, into this, um, this setup to actually get people to learn how to use the system. So it was interesting to see that the amount of training that actually came into the job as well as the amount of archival work. So at, at the first or the second actual academic place I worked at was Governor State University. Once again, this isn't chronological. Um, one of the things we had is instead of having a system we built ourselves or a system that was um, that we purchased from someone, we kind of had the, the only one that the library would actually let us have because it was free. So we went with DSpace. Um, we had a DSpace instance when I started at Governor State and we were going to keep that DSpace instance no matter what. So we had to learn how to use it. Um, we had to completely rebuild it from scratch. We actually took it from the bottom up and built, rebuilt everything. Um, weekends, I was in with our IT department actually building this thing, learning how to build it and rebuilding it from scratch. Uh, I'm not a programmer by nature, but um, I learned how to completely build an older version of DSpace. So this was 2010, it's, uh, it's hopefully advanced since then, or 2009, sorry. Um, so hopefully it's advanced since then, but that we actually built this thing from scratch. Um, one of the first projects I worked on was actually our 2009 reaccreditation bid for Governor State University. So I was able to try to sell this new slash old um, repository to the university by, by actually trying to get documents to put into um, the repository for the reaccreditation people who were coming in to look at the school. So the first project we had was actually uh, a life or death project where we actually were, um, we were the people who were actually getting the documents that would reaccreditate the school. So I was able to work with university, um, pers university personnel, presidents, um, present and past. I worked with professors, I worked with community organizations, I worked with students, everyone to actually get everything into the system and to get buy-in to, buy to actually use the system. Um, we collected the assets from them. We had to do a lot of um, scanning and digitization. We had to actually get everything ready to get into the dam or into the, into the archival system. So we had to actually work on getting these in as opposed to other places where I had the, the ability to um, have them already digital, or digital. So um, metadata, once again, traditional metadata we actually followed. Um, organization and ingest. Um, we collected them and uploaded, um, usually having, having to scan and then upload them. Um, we did not have the ability to do batch uploads, so we put in roughly 3,000 documents one at a time. Uh, it was one of the things that was lost in the learning curve was actually how to batch upload. Um, once again, it was three non-experts working on a system that they didn't understand. So one of the trials of that was it required a lot of extra time um, just doing upload by upload by upload by upload. So The first position I had, which is actually when, um, when I got right out of grad school, was at the University of Toledo. And we actually worked with the, the repository through Ohio Link or through the state of Ohio, which was an incredibly well put together system. One of the nice things though was it wasn't hosted by us. So we had limited infrastructure. Actually the only infrastructure we had was my computer. Um, so I could actually upload things into it. I did the metadata, I did everything. Um, the buy-in was actually to try to sell it to my manager who was more of a traditional archivist who saw these systems as a way to draw people into the archive as opposed to as a, a delivery system to actually get people to use the stuff that was actually, that we were trying to get out there. So it was more of a, a marketing tool to bring people in as opposed to a delivery tool. Um, the metadata was once again pretty standard. The organization in ingest was just grabbing things that we had. I had to do a lot of analog to uh, digital or digitization. We had to scan a lot of stuff and taking digital files that we had in the past and moving them into the system as well just by a simple upload. So lessons learned. Um, one of the most important things I learned, especially with, with DSpace, is open source, while free, is also very expensive. One of the issues we ran into is we had three non-experts building this system. Uh, we relied a lot on the DSpace community, which was great. Um, we worked with a lot of good people in different universities um, and, and worked with them to learn how to make the system better, how to make sure that we um, could optimize the system as best as possible. But three people, as the last presenters said, you know, three people who are not working on this as their core duties, we only had so much time to do this, and we were three non-experts who were already behind the eight ball to start with. Um, so open source, while free, is also incredibly expensive. It was one of the first things that we looked at at um, Masco Cabinetry, was they wanted a free open source system, and it was one of the things I talked them out of, because I knew that we didn't have the personnel, I knew we did not have the developers, I knew we didn't have the time to build this system, to maintain this system, to do it on site, or in the cloud or anywhere else because we just simply did not have the, um, 
the tools to do it. So luckily I knew this going in and it saved us a lot of headache. So on the other side though, expensive dam solutions have incredible or have a lot of hidden costs. Um, once again, the biggest one would be time. We had this system where we could upload things in through your know, batch ingest and batch uh, metadata and do those types of things. But a lot of it was based on the bandwidth that we had in the building at the time. So I was actually working usually on the dam system from 6 p.m. until like 10 or 11 at night. And then on some days I was working in, um, from early morning through about eight o'clock in the morning just so I could actually have enough bandwidth to get stuff in there. Um, we had a problem with that all the way through the project. Um, it's one of the things is it, they'll sell the cloud as being one of the greatest things in the world. Problem is, is it requires you to update your, your own infrastructure to make sure that you can actually run the systems at, at the proper speeds and to make sure that things don't time out. So dam solutions can be, um, do have actually a lot of hidden costs. Um, number three was to thoroughly test um, prior to purchase. We tested everything but the plugins. We tested, you know, ingest. We, we tested um, getting documents or getting assets out of there. This was at Masco. One of the things we didn't test was they had a plugin that we were supposed to use for our files. Um, a lot of marketing creatives use InDesign files, which is an Adobe Creative Suite file, and it requires um, a link to files that are in uh, either on your computer or on a server or something like that. And the plugins were the, the route to actually link you to the, the assets that you're putting into your InDesign files. Um, we did not know that it didn't work on PCs. Well, it works on PCs, but it didn't work on 32-bit PCs, which most corporate companies or corporations have as, you know, to run old legacy systems. So we went into this with actually the wrong system, not knowing that it wouldn't work or that it would fail to work for a good deal of the people we worked with, um, which I will freely admit was a, a failure on my part. Um, another one was getting buy-in in writing. We had a lot of people, um, both at Governor State and also at Masco, uh, so both the academic and the corporate world, who agreed to use this system, who thought the system was great. But once they actually got to the point where they had to use the system, um, they, they balked on it. They actually decided they didn't need to use the system, didn't want to use the system, or they didn't want to change their, um, their own habits. Uh, a lot of people like to store a file locally on their computer, leave it there, or getting to a, a server is easy. Um, a lot of people didn't want to actually use an archival system or a digital asset management system to, to, to work with files um, because there was just an extra step or two that was put in the process to re-upload it after you had completed it to overwrite the file. Um, they didn't want to do that, even though we had explained it to them before. So we didn't have the buy-in in writing prior to the, um, the project starting, which unfortunately was one of the, the problems we ran into. Um, another one is keeping human nature in mind. Uh, people have habits. People have the way they like to do things. They also don't like to change how they do things. Um, we were fighting an uphill battle at Masco because we were fighting against people who had used our servers for years. I mean, it was, it was something that just every year, every couple of years, it got updated, and they just kept using the same system. They they dealt with some files getting deleted or disappearing, and it was just something that they were they were fine dealing with. And then moving them to this system, which required them to log on to search as as opposed to browse for files, um, that was something that they didn't want to do. So. We didn't actually think about the fact that they would not want to change their, their ways of doing things, which is something that I failed and something that needs to be kept in mind when trying to sell this pro sell a project like this to a, to a corporation or to a large group of individuals who are going to use the system. Um, another one that's not on here is um, access versus preservation. I've always come from a preservation background as, as an archivist um, in training. Um, so I, I came from a, a preservation side and I had to learn the access side. And you have to learn how to marry the two to actually have the files. You want to make sure you save them. You want to make sure you have the metadata built into the files. Um, but you also want to make sure that you preserve them and then have them available to your, uh, your customers, your clients, your students, whoever, your patrons um, at a moment's notice. So just keeping those two in mind and trying to find a marriage of the two um, was one thing that was learned out of this. And then the last one was not to overpromise. Um, one of the reasons why, Mass or why Morgan Street document systems failed was we had overpromised. We promised um, one client that we could get all this, you know, 350,000 um, documents into the system in two months and have it fully cataloged and organized and ready to go for them. We could do this in two months with another customer. We, we promised that we could actually move in all of their email files to take that out of something they had to store on site. They could store them all in our, our system. Um, our salespeople promised that and it's something we couldn't do. And unfortunately, that hurt our credibility. And we eventually lost those customers, which then led to the failing of the company. So 
one of the more, more important lessons learned was not to overpromise, not to um, oversell your system, oversell your abilities, oversell your staff. Because if you do that, you're going to set yourself up to fail. So some future ideas, some future thoughts. Um, so corporate versus academic, um, damn, they can be managed similar. And there are a lot of things that are, um, that are similar between the two. Uh, I, I brought a lot of my academic knowledge and my academic archives um, skills into my, my work with Masco cabinetry and my work with Morgan Street document systems. I actually brought a lot of archival principles into that organization, um, working with uh, metadata, making sure the metadata was correct, making sure there was a schema as opposed to just random metadata. Um, trying to limit the amount of voices in the metadata. Um, one of the issues we had at Masco Cabinetry is we decided to crowdsource the metadata, which was something um, I'm sure if anyone's listening to this, they're probably shocked at that. Um, they decided that you know this was too much for one person who was going to handle multiple other roles. So we're just going to get a lot of people to put in metadata. We're going to have a lot of people administrator rights. We're going to give them the ability to upload, to put things where they want to put them, to create their own metadata, and we're just going to hope for the best. Um, which coming from a, a traditional archival world is terrifying and it was terrifying and it, unfortunately it didn't work and we had a lot of assets that were misplaced, lost, um, stuff that just ended up in weird places, people were creating folders, um, it was a gigantic mess. So one of the things I tried to do was try to educate um, the people I worked with, my, the executives, my managers, my supervisors and educate them on just tra traditional archival principles to get them to understand you know, the need for organization, the need for structure. The need for you know simplistic metadata that just describes as opposed to has every single possible thing you could possibly want. There were some some items that ended up having 80 pieces of metadata on them, which is just insane. Um, so just teaching traditional archival principles to corporate digital asset management, um, and you could use this to drive um, to drive down costs because you would have one person working on this. You could have one person who makes sure the system works the first time as opposed to me having to go back into the system, find these documents, find these assets, go back and clean them up. We were doing rework upon rework upon rework because of saving money up front by having you know, one person do multiple jobs instead of one person actually just focusing on the metadata and focusing on the organization. Um, so you're also then still supposed to work with your users for arrangement of metadata. So we don't want to rule them out of the process. But we have to make sure that they have a voice in this, but we don't want them to be doing the uploading. But there are some things where our users are the experts. Um, there are times where they are the experts in how people use things as well. So working with them to find a middle ground to make sure that there is a, um, a buy-in for the project, to make sure that people want to use this product. And one of the ways for them to want to do it is to have them feel invested in it, to make sure that they, um, they feel that it is their system. So getting them to work on the metadata and the arrangement, but not actually doing it themselves was one of the things that, um, that I learned in this process. I've, I've learned over time. Um, another one was actually embedding metadata in the files. Um, a lot of corporate digital asset management systems do not do that. They allow you the ability to create multiple fields that do not actually go with the, um, the file. So you can create all these crazy metadata fields to explain things however you want to do it. But if you actually take that document or that asset out of the system, all of that metadata is lost. So one of the things to remember, especially in a corporate world where you know, systems change, people's ideas change, when regimes change, and you move from system to system, migrating from system to system, is to make sure that the metadata actually goes with the item. Uh, I know that seems incredibly simple and incredibly um, logical and something that just makes sense, but it's something that was not actually pitched by any of the people that I worked with from any of these digital asset management companies. It was, we have this system, it has this, this metadata, you'll be fine. And we noticed when we pulled the files out that metadata was lost. Luckily, we found this out early, and we're able to uh, make sure that we didn't um, we didn't lose a lot of information. And then one of the things I, I saw from one of the past presentations it was from the Missouri Kansas City people. Sorry, I forgot your names. Um, was defining good enough. It was one of the things that we had different perspectives on what was good enough and what was required to get stuff into our system. I was looking for the highest quality image because um, you could then use the system to export a different export images out into different um, different resolutions and different quality and stuff like that whereas we had people who wanted to have seven different images in there from different resolutions so they could just grab the file they wanted and be good to go um, we also had the metadata issue where there are people who are looking to put in 80 pieces of metadata for each item so that it was impossible not to find it in the search well it was also then coming up in every single search 
So one of the things I had to work with are um, all the people involved in the system, a lot of whom did not actually come from archival uh, backgrounds, was work with them on defining what is good enough. And in the end, we decided that there was like a certain level of metadata. We had to have at least 10 pieces of metadata for each file. Um, that was the average. And work on just making sure we had that much information, making sure that we had good high quality metadata as opposed to a lot of metadata, um, you know, quality versus quantity, and make sure that we actually had quality metadata in there instead of a lot. So um, that is actually all I have to, uh, to discuss today. Um, sorry, I'm actually coming off the flu, so I'm a little flighty right now. So um, I can open it up to questions if anyone has any questions. Thank you, Greg, for the presentation. And uh, the first question we have here is, did you create a documentation for each of the, these projects? Uh, did you say, did I create documentation for them? Yeah, for, yes. for, uh, for those okay. projects. Gotcha, sorry, my, uh, my speakers on my computer are not the greatest. Um, yes, I made it a point to document everything that I did. Um, when at Masco Cabinetry, uh, I was in the process of creating um, a large amount of documentation. So WebDAM came with its own documentation. They had what they had called like the WebDAM community. That was the digital asset management system we went with. Um, made sure you know to use their system and to use their um, you know their information and use the information from people in the community. But there was some stuff that was specific to Masco cabinetry. So we had um, specific documentation using um, or going over you know the ingest process, um, how to set up you know groups, permissions, stuff like that. So I made sure that I documented everything that we did um, in the process. Um, while at Governor State, I was in the process of doing it, but there was just not a lot of time to do it. But there was some basic documentation as well. Uh, when I was with Morgan Street Document System, I was actually in charge of the documentation, which was actually quite fun and brought back the, the teaching side of me. So I was able to create documents. Um, we used a specific type of scanner we required our customers to use. It was a uh, I can't remember what type of scanner it is, but we required them to use a specific scanner and uh, Fujitsu something. And so I created documentation for that on top of the documentation that Fujitsu had, um, as well as documentation on how to upload, how to put metadata in, you know, what standards we needed, stuff like that. And then also worked with those clients to actually explain it to them and say, you know, this is why we're doing this. This is why we do this. This is why we use the scanner. This is why we have to have this information and this is why you need to have this level of quality and stuff like that. So there was documentation as well as um, education. Okay, and next question we have here is, what skills do you feel was most valuable that you brought over from the corporate world? And uh, what skills do you feel was most valuable that you brought over from the academic world? Okay, um, from the corporate world, actually I'll start off with the academic world. Um, a lot of the stuff that I learned in graduate school helped me with the organization and understanding um, like patterns and paths and understanding where things should go. So actually working with our clients and our customers or the people I worked with to make sure um, that things were organized properly. So I brought a lot of that from graduate school. I brought a lot of that from the University of Toledo and from other positions, um, as well as just from you know basic life, you know, learning how to organize and stuff like that. So I brought a lot of that from the academic world. Um, I think the corporate world solidified more of needing workflows and needing documentation. Uh, I must admit I was a little light in workflows and working with project management and stuff prior to starting off with Masco cabinetry, but it further reinforced um, the need for, for stronger project management skills, um, it, which I then learned in the, in the process of doing that. Um, it, it further reinforced the, needing, the need to have proper workflows, to, proper, um, to properly document those workflows, to make sure that there is a set in writing path of how things are supposed to go. So it kind of made me more concrete, I guess, in my thinking. It made me more um, documented as well, coming from the corporate world. Um, but I think a lot of the organization, a lot of the actual skills that I used to, I guess the best way to describe it is a lot of the stuff I, I used to actually run the projects I learned in the corporate world and a lot of the stuff I actually did on the ground in the field working with the assets I learned in, uh, from my archival training and then also from, um, from my education. Uh, working in the both large and the small organizations, both academic and the corporate, what would you recommend to the organizations that have uh, limited the staff and the resources mm -hmm. and that are trying to implement a dam system? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I would make sure that I would want them to make sure is that they actually understand the system that they're purchasing or that they're using. 
um, if they're going with an open source one, make sure they're tied into the community that they work with. Um, one of the things that Dan Noonan and the other guy, sorry, I'm horrible, Darnell, um, I'm horrible with names, um, spoke about was that you know they were reliant on the Fedora and other communities um, for the use of their system. You, you want to make sure you're tied in like they are. You want to make sure you're tied in with a group of experts. Um, if you're buying a digital asset management system, you have um, inherent experts and the people who built the system, who sold you the system, as well as a lot of them are trying to get more into this like crowdsourcing of, um, of support. So they'll actually have people who are creating little, you know, um, some, some types of materials to actually share amongst the, the community to use. Um, but I would highly recommend to make sure that you, you really do know what you're buying or what you're getting um, when you get it. Um, I know that sounds overly simplistic, but it is something I think is lost. Um, I know with Masco, I lost out to people who wanted the shiniest system with the most bells and whistles. And we actually didn't look at other systems that had better documentation that were more simplistic, that were easier to use. And I lost out to that. Um, so if you're looking at a system, make sure you actually understand the system you're buying. Make sure you thoroughly vet it. Um, one of the things I didn't do with Masco because we didn't have the time is I should have spent more time and um, working with it and actually trying to break it. One of the things we did at Morgan Street Document Systems is, oddly enough, they would buy us a bunch of pizza and beer. They put a bunch of people in a room and they would just let us try to break the system. You know, try to upload this and then stop it. Try to do this, that, this, that, that, and try to break the system. And we did that as testing. So I would highly recommend testing the snot out of it, which is actually an exact quote I got from a, a dam manager um, at a company in Ohio. You know, test the snot out of it, make sure it works. Um, when you're working with your personnel, um, you just have to make sure you understand what the task is. There are a lot of times where people think that digital asset management is just sticking a file in a system and then you're done. There's no you know, worrying about um, you know, how long it's supposed to be in the system. There's no actual worry about metadata. It's purely just you sticking a file in the server and you're done. You know, any monkey could do it. Type, type mentality and it's um, a lot of it is lost on people who actually do not come from an archival background or a library background or a dam management background. So one of the things is just making sure you understand what you're, what you're getting your employee into and making sure you allot enough time for it. Um, I was also handi handling the creation of marketing materials for three brands and 11 channels as, opposed, as well as also doing um, digital asset management which is just not something that's going to work. Um, so make sure you actually allot enough time for your, your personnel to do what you need them to do. And then also make sure you understand your core audience. Uh, you wanna make sure you actually understand who you're working with and who you're trying to get things to, as well as who you're getting them from. Uh, make sure you actually understand, you know, the, the sources where you're getting your information and who you're trying to get it out to. Okay, uh, another question is, how was the retention of digital objects addressed by the corporates and academic mm -hmm. institutes you work at? Okay. Um, and the corporate side, I'll, I'll just use Masco as the, because um, more unfortunately, Market Street wasn't around long enough to actually worry about retention. Um, with Masco, we actually in, embedded in the web dev system was actually a, a system that would actually pull documents down based on a certain time period that you put them in for. So it, it was kind of, it, it was a nice um, perk of the system as it would actually um, pull things down after a certain period of time. Um, one of the things I made sure was we actually had a dark archive as well. So we had the web dev system, which was the public system. But then I also had a, another system where I actually kept everything that we pulled down from the system, stuff that we just didn't want to have up there, stuff that had um, information that we wanted to retain, but we didn't want to have public. Um, I made sure I had two systems. The, the second one was a, a, a free system that we had. It was just, in essence, it was nothing more than just a gigantic server, but it was um, set up as a proper archive to make sure we actually had things and retain them. One of the things I had with that is I had reasonably unlimited space, which worked out nicely. I had 99 terabytes of stuff, or yeah, 99 terabytes of space to work with, so I, I wasn't going to run out of space. So I retained everything. Um, I made sure, you know, past um, images. I had kitchens from the 1970s. I had, you know, kitchens with people smoking in them as their, you know, marketing materials. I made sure I saved everything. So I would just make sure um, for retention, just. If you have a nice system that actually has retention in it, make sure you actually follow their retention rules. Because a lot of damn systems will pull things down for you. Um, if not, just make sure you embed that in the metadata. And then if you have some kind of report, you can pull depending on the system. Um, so you can actually just have that as part of your, your metadata as well. Uh, I don't have, we don't have, I, I don't have any question here. Okay. And thank you, Greg, for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you for uh, if uh, anybody uh, can think of a further question, you can just uh, you can send it to us, and we will forward to Greg, and uh, the question will be answered by email. 
And now it's uh, um, lunch break, and uh, the next session will start at the 2 p.m. Central Standard Time. And see you guys soon. Bye now.